following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. So, as part of um, closing out this series on our journey as Christians, we're going to talk a little bit about that part of our journey that lasts forever. Um, you could call it, as Chris said, the journey of living that takes place after our life on this earth. And really one of the great hopes of Christianity is that life doesn't end in the grave, but that there will be a resurrection. And as a disclaimer, I should probably mention um, that I did teach a lesson on a Sunday night a little while ago about this same subject. Um, I tried to keep a few good parts, so some of this might sound familiar to some of you. And, and really, our hope of, uh, of a future resurrection, as with everything else, it centers on Jesus and on his own resurrection. Paul says in Romans 1.4 that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by or through the resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is one of the main focal points in the New Testament. And in fact, every single sermon in the book of Acts emphasizes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So much so that after preaching in Athens, the Greeks thought that Paul was introducing two new gods, one called Jesus and one called resurrection. And what is meant by that Romans 1-4 verse that we just read is that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the primary evidence for his claim to be the Messiah and the Son of God. More than anything else, we know that Jesus is who he claimed to be because he rose from the dead. And we're going to talk more about Jesus' resurrection later, but keep in mind that the historical fact of his physical bodily resurrection is the key component that testifies to his divinity. That lays the foundation for the importance of the fact that we will rise from the dead. Right? For we are called to follow after him in that victory over death. Each one of us who are Christians here this morning. But how many of us think about eternal life in terms of a bodily resurrection. I saw uh, an ABC News Washington Post poll that said that 82% of the Americans who believed in heaven believe that heaven is a place where people exist only spiritually, not bodily. But the Bible doesn't say that a purely spiritual heaven is our eternal home. The idea of a ghostly, disembodied spiritual existence in heaven is more of a temporary state where we await the resurrection. It's not meant to be our permanent home, our permanent state. And I believe that the more you grasp that, the more you will be able to see your future eternal existence as something tangible and concrete. Its hope will increase. Rather than a vague, misty world where you're almost like a shadow of yourself, it's something real. And one last thing before we get into our text for this morning. Um, don't let all this talk about our future hope overshadow the fact that God is with us right now. I like how the Christian apologist Josh McDowell puts it. He says, although the resurrection promises us a new life and a perfect life in the future, God loves us too much to leave us alone to contend with any pain, guilt, or loneliness in our present life. As we see in Philippians 4, verse 7, it says that the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this peace is a promise for now. Christianity is not simply about a future hope to look forward to, although that is a foundational component. So turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And in the section that we're going to look at this morning... The Apostle Paul says that we are looking forward to a future hope and glory. And then he says that that glory is not simply restricted to us, but that it extends to all of creation as well. So we're going to start in uh, Romans 8, verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So here Paul says that any sufferings we have in this life can't even begin to compare to the glory that will be revealed to us in the future. So now let's read on to see what that glory is. Verses 19 through 21. 
For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So he still hasn't told us exactly what that future hope and glory is in these verses. But, in those past three verses, he has said that our future hope extends into all of creation. It says that creation itself will be set free and turned into glory along with us. So now that we understand that idea that creation will be set free in the same way we will be, verse 22 tells us a little bit about how this transformation of creation will take place. Let's read Romans 8, verse 22. He says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So by comparing this uh, redemption or setting free of creation to childbirth, Paul is saying that it will be dramatic even violent event. There will not be some gradual upgrading, I guess, of the world until it's perfect, but rather the redemption of the universe will be violent and traumatic, like giving birth. And I don't claim to know exactly how that will happen. If we read uh, 2 Peter 3.12, the last portion of that verse says that the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Maybe... God will miraculously step in and end the natural order as we know it. Or maybe it will be done providentially through what scientists call a big crunch or some other natural event that can be described by astrophysics. I don't know. But either way, something traumatic will precede this um, setting free of the heavens and the earth that Paul talks about here in Romans. Now the next verse in our passage turns to us. Let's read verse 23 in Romans chapter 8. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, which is the redemption of our body. As Christians, we're adopted into God's household. And, and that adoption begins by the redemption of our soul. Right, which takes place through faith and repentance and in the waters of baptism. But it's fulfilled by the future redemption of our bodies. And, and he says that we feel this groaning for redemption within ourselves. Did you catch that? We, we groan and long, and that feeling that you have as a Christian is for the redemption of your body, whether you know it or not. So let's talk about, for, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. I think that most of us can identify with this feeling, that, that feeling of longing or, or groaning. Just before this chapter in Romans 7, Paul talks about how Christians have an internal struggle within themselves. He says that uh, on the one hand, our soul wants to follow God, but our body is corrupted and often leads us into sin. And he says that we often give in to that temptation even though we don't want to. Right? Don't you recognize that in yourself? And don't you long for that struggle to cease? So part of that longing that we feel is for a redeemed body that will not feed this internal struggle. A body that is in tune with our spirit. Shed of all the baggage or issues that are in the current flesh that we carry. To better understand this longing or groaning, imagine what it would be like if your body was naturally predisposed to do good rather than sin. Instead of leading you away from God and distracting you, imagine if your nature led you closer to God and helped you focus on Him every second of the day. That's part of the idea behind us longing for the redemption of our bodies. Another aspect of this longing is the desire to be free of death and decay and sickness. And Paul is saying here that these longings will be satisfied by the redemption of our bodies and by the redemption of this creation. 
Notice that he is specifically not saying that we will abandon our bodies and abandon this creation and live in some purely spiritual existence. And so with that being said, I want to talk briefly just a little more about this idea of redemption. That's the, Paul, that's the word Paul used. He says the redemption of our bodies. And he also equated this with being set free in one of the earlier verses. So what is redemption? Right? When you redeem something or set it free, you don't completely scrap what's there and start over with something completely different. Rather, redemption is liberating what has come to be enslaved. That's how it was used in biblical times. Um, when people were enslaved, they could be redeemed or set free through various ways in the Old Testament law. And, and part of the reason why that's included in the Old Testament is in order to foreshadow the great Christian idea of the redemption of all things. So to say that the redemption of our bodies means that there will be no physical body at all is simply incorrect. Just as our souls are redeemed now and yet still remain souls, so our bodies will be redeemed later when Jesus returns and yet we will still have bodies. And as we saw in Romans 8, this future promise of redemption also applies to all of creation. The new heavens and the new earth that are talked about in Revelation 21 will still be a heavens and an earth, but it will be redeemed, transformed, changed, glorified, set free, and drenched in God's presence and love. That's the glory of the new heavens and the new earth, not some vague spiritualized place with no substance. Now we're going to move over to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for most of the remainder of our time this morning. And you'll probably notice that we're going to skip some verses in the interest of time. I'd encourage you to go back and read the chapter on your own. 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the greatest chapter in res uh, on resurrection in the whole Bible. It talks about Christ's resurrection, the general resurrection from the dead, and our resurrected bodies. And so let's start with the first few verses in the beginning to set the context. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. This passage is basically an early Christian formula that included the most important elements of the faith. And you can see that it basically summarizes Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And it includes a list of eyewitnesses to the risen Christ that you could then go interview if you lived in the first century. The early church made it a point to establish the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the cornerstone of their faith and ours. And did you notice the same progression that we see here? It was in the lyrics of that last song that we sang, Man of Sorrows. We sang in the beginning portion that the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. We sang that his debt takes away our sin and sets us free. And then in the last verse we said, See the stone is rolled away, behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised, he's risen from the grave. And you might not always realize it, but the words of sound Christian worship songs can help instill good foundational doctrine in us. Songs stick with us, don't they? And that's a good thing when Christ's death, sacrificial atoning death and resurrection are, are imprinted on our minds through song. And Paul talks about the importance of Christ's resurrection in the next few verses we're going to skip and read from verses 12 through 17 now in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. 
Moreover, we are found even to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. It is not an overstatement to say that Christianity stands or falls on the historicity of the resurrection of the Son of God. And again, the fact that Jesus physically did rise from the dead is a real historical event. However improbable you may think it is, it actually happened almost 2,000 years ago in a particular place in Palestine on a particular Sunday morning. It's not a myth or a legend. Early Harvard Law professor and one of the fathers of modern apologetics, Dr. Simon Greenleaf, said that according to the laws of legal evidence used in courts of law, there is more evidence for the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than for just about any other event in history. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very good. And the authenticity of scriptures is overwhelming. But establishing his resurrection and the truth of scripture is not the purpose of this current um, uh, message. What we're talking about this morning is that Christ's resurrection has dramatic implications on our future hope as Christians. With Christ raised, we will be raised. If Christ was not raised, we have no hope whatsoever. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits, notice that term, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So in that passage, Paul twice calls Jesus' resurrection the first fruits. And what that term means is that Jesus is the first to be raised in a glorious and incorruptible body and that he will be followed by others who will also be raised. And we Christians are the others. We will follow him. We are those who are his at his coming, as we see in verse 23. This is one of the most important implications of his resurrection. Not only does it prove his claim to be the Son of God, not only does it show that the Father accepted his sacrifice, not only does it validate his message as to who he is, but it also spreads the same new life into those who are united to him. And that new life has an already but not yet component to it. What I mean by that is that we receive spiritual life now That's the already portion of it. But our future hope is a bodily resurrection and new life in that sense. That's the not yet portion that we receive at his coming, as we saw there in verse 23. So we have seen so far, looking at these texts, that we will certainly rise from the dead. So now let's keep reading and see what this glorified body will be like. Um, the next verse that we're going to look at is a, it's a question posed by Paul, and then it's answered quickly, shortly, I guess I should say, and then expanded on. So we're going to start, read the question in verse 35, and then the immediate reaction um, from Paul to this question. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35, here's the question. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? And Paul's response here at the beginning of verse 36 is, you fool. You fool. Exclamation point. The NAS has an exclamation point there. And that seemingly insensitive answer, you you couldn't say that in a safe space, that will make sense in a minute here. But let me explain why he quotes that question in verse 35. So basically that question, uh, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come, that was probably a stock question that was asked by people to try to stump those who believed in a bodily resurrection. So basically, 
The skeptic of the general resurrection would say, oh, you believe in a bodily resurrection? Well then, what kind of body will it be? And then whatever explanation is given, they would mock and, and try to poke holes in. But Paul very bluntly calls these people fools. And, and, and that may not be perceived as being very sensitive to those who disagree, but this is a serious issue because it is so central to our hope as Christians. Think about what he said in verses 12 through 19, remember? If there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised either, and our faith is worthless. We are still in our sins. So it's of infinite importance. If there is no general resurrection, he says, then neither did Christ raise. So now let's read the, the full passage here and see the full answer. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. But someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, notice this, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. So, so here Paul explains that our current body dies, and it will give way to the new body, just like we see in nature. A seed is planted, and something grows that looks very different than the seed. And he's saying that our glorified bodies will be as different from our current bodies as maybe an oak tree is different from an acorn. And that's quite a transformation. It's important to understand that the event of the resurrection, what he's trying to guard against is that we don't see the resurrection as, a, as a, a reanimation of rotting corpses bursting through the ground like a zombie apocalypse. We will be transformed and glorified in a way that we cannot even begin to imagine. So the resurrected body will still be a body, even if it's different in some sense. As different as a pine cone is from a an oak tree or a, a redwood tree. So let's pick up in verses 42 through 44. It says, So also, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And I love those contrasts. We go from perishable to imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, and from natural to spiritual. And I think that that last part um, in verse 40, uh, the beginning of verse 44 is my favorite, where he says it's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. And that reminds me of uh, Mark 14, 38, where Jesus says in the last portion of that verse that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is the same idea that we were talking about, if you remember earlier in Romans 7 and 8. Remember that internal struggle of our spirit against our body? Remember that this is part of the reason that we long for the redemption of our bodies, as we saw there in Romans 8? We long for the time when our bodies and our spirits will be in perfect harmony. And, and instead of pulling you away from God, your body draws you nearer to Him. That's the idea of having a spiritual body. It's not talking about the substance of the glorified body as being purely spiritual. It's talking about the engine or what drives it or how it conforms. And to me, that's one of the most encouraging things about the resurrected state. That harmony between body and spirit. The Elimination of the internal conflict. This, uh, this understanding of the spiritual body and of our resurrection in general is universal among serious Christian scholars. Dr. Jack Cottrell discusses this idea in his book, The Faith Once for All, which is a book I believe every Christian should have and study. Dr. Cottrell writes, Our bodies will be like Christ's glorified body. We must not assume that because our, the resurrected body is called spiritual, that it will have no form or substance. They will be spiritual bodies, but they will still be bodies as distinct from our spirits and will be visible and solid components of the renewed, visible universe. 
it is important to understand that there will be a substantive component of the new redeemed creation, which includes us. See, um, physical things are not bad in and of themselves. In fact, the idea that anything physical is inherently bad is an idea based on pagan religions, Greek philosophy, and Gnosticism. Whereas, on the other hand, the Bible teaches that nature was originally created good and that one day, as we saw, it will be redeemed and that we will have a large part in that new creation. Look, there's no use trying to be more spiritual than God himself. Our God is the God of wheat and water and trees, of food and drink and sunshine. He is the joyful creator. In fact, he has become incarnate himself. And not only that, but he uses physical things to accompany spiritual events in us, such as the waters of baptism and the bread and juice of the Lord's Supper that we took earlier. God loves matter. He invented it, right? Now, it is true that our flesh has been corrupted by sin. But the point is, is that sin is precisely why our flesh is corrupted. It's because of sin, not because physical things are inherently bad. Let me um, repeat that. Our flesh is corrupted because of sin, not because physical things are inherently evil. That's why the Bible uses the word flesh with a negative connotation sometimes. It's more precisely talking about our corrupted sinful nature, which has a home in our current bodies. And that's the way I think the NIV translates it. It's not a blanket statement that physical matter is bad. So to continue quoting Jack Cottrell, he goes on to say that the resurrection of the body is a unique element in Christian faith and hope. It is foreign to the pagan concept that only the soul has value and survives forever. In the Bible, the resurrection of the body is a basic doctrine and an essential, an essential part of our salvation. We are not what God created, created us to be without our bodies. The pagan idea of the immortality of the soul is completely unsatisfactory. The resurrection of our glorified bodies to be united with our made perfect spirits will give us an eternally perfect existence. Amen. Remember after God created the heavens and the earth? He said it was very good. There was not any implication that the physical creation was a mistake. Yes, it needs to be redeemed because of sin, but it's not as if God will simply eliminate it and revert everything back to some purely spiritual existence. That's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Now let's continue in 1 Corinthians 15. and in, the, in these next verses, Paul goes into the great mystery and victory and fulfillment that will occur at the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the completion of the birth pangs that we read about in Romans and the melting of the elements in 2 Peter. So keep in mind everything that we've talked about as we read this next portion. Verses 51 through 57 in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometime, maybe this morning, or maybe not for thousands of years, we will all be changed and made imperishable and immortal. And that victory over death is through our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the first fruits by His resurrection. He rolled away the stone and walked out of the tomb, so that we would be able to follow him, just as Paul described. So that death would be stripped of its ultimate power over us and the creation. If you are in Christ, your spirit is redeemed now, 
and your body will be redeemed in the fullness of time. That is the power of His resurrection for you. Believe it and look forward to your future hope of a bodily resurrection and a home with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. A home with the Lord. That, that, the last point I want to make this morning is that we will be with God in this resurrected state in a much more clear and full way than we are now. And we haven't talked too much about God's presence in this redeemed creation, but that's one of the most important aspects of eternal life. Jesus says in John 17, 3, when he's praying to the Father during his high priestly prayer, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life, resurrected bodies, a new creation, it's nothing without knowing God and dwelling in his presence there. Can you imagine the horror of living forever and being bored and being despondent and having no hope for the future and no, nothing new in the present? It's God's presence. Revelation 21.3 says that in the new heavens and the new earth, the tabernacle of God will be among men and he will dwell among them and God himself will be among them. And the word used there in Revelation 21 is the same word used in John 1.14 when it says that Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us, it says. So it's not just a better earth with better bodies. Not at all. It is the direct, glorious presence of God with us. He will be keenly perceptible and eternally satisfying. We won't be fulfilled for eternity simply because we have new bodies or because the new earth will be beautiful or interesting. It is only because He is there that we will never grow tired of our eternal existence. God is infinite and we are not. We never will be. We always have a starting point. So we will be able to search God's wisdom and character and love forever. There is no end to the riches of His grace. He is inexhaustible. It's been said that even after 10,000 ages have passed, we will not even have gotten our arms around the foothills of His mountains. The call will ever be for us to move further up and further in. And the band can come up. I think they've already started. At the end of the last battle, which is C.S. Lewis's final book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, many of the characters in the books end up in this new glorious creation. And Lewis closes by saying this. Now for us, this is the end of all the stories and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever. And think about this, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So it will be for us. I've got to confess, I don't think about eternity this way as much as I should. But that's what it is. Each moment in glory will be better than the one before and we will ever be drawing closer to God and reigning over that glorious, redeemed creation in bodies imperishable. I really hope that these um, thoughts on the resurrection were encouraging to you and I would challenge you to focus more on this promised resurrection that we as Christians have to look forward to. And if you're here today and uh, you're not a Christian, if you haven't given your life to Christ and been baptized into His name, then uh, we would welcome you to come up and talk to us so that you too can have the hope of a resurrection and an eternal life that we talked about today. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, thank you for his resurrection and for ours. Amen.